Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. Happy New Year! Happy New Year. I forgot my kazoo. I was going to bring one of those kazoo things. It's, it's New Year. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the church's New Year. Happy New Year to all. So there's a true story. Two senior citizens who went walking every morning together, right? Because they needed to stretch. They were out for their usual morning walk. They both had been complaining about the aches and pains of getting older. One, oh, my back is killing me. And the other one said, oh, both knees are cracking every time I move. And my shoulder hurts. And uh, they were just going at it. Well, as they were going back and forth with this, they passed the local funeral home. One of them turned to the other and said, look, there's no hope of recovery. We're just getting older and older. Let's just go in and give ourselves up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, a for sale ad in a newspaper read, Hope Chest, brand new, half price, long story. Long story. So this morning we begin the season of Advent. It's a time of preparation, of of getting ready, readying ourselves. It's a season of hope. And we not only prepare for the celebration of the Incarnation, the coming of the Christ child, but we're also reminded that we live in between times, between Jesus' first coming and his long-awaited and promised second coming. And so with that thought in mind, one Sunday after worship, a mom was talking to her young daughter. She told her daughter that according to the Bible, Jesus will come back one day. The daughter asked, well, when will that be? And mom said, well, I don't rightly know. And the little girl said, well, can't you look it up on the internet? Isn't that true? I mean, wouldn't that be great if we could Google Jesus, we could Google Jesus and get his itinerary? We could, we could get the schedule, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, it would be great. It would solve all kinds of world problems and personal problems, right? If Jesus would just say that, okay, folks, I am returning by 11 a.m. Sunday morning, December 2nd, 2018, right? And I'm telling you that the folks who slept in this morning because they stayed up late watching Ohio State would be really bummed out, right? They'd be really bummed out. But seriously, if we knew when, if we knew when, we'd we'd be ready, right? If we just knew the day, we would be ready. We'd have everything spotless and in order just as you clean your homes before the guests come, right? But we don't know. We don't know. And just Jesus reminds us of that significant fact this morning. And he also reminds us that all we can do is live ready. Live ready. Every single day, live ready. And that's kind of the hard part, right? It's hard because life is kind of like a glass of water half full. Some of us see only the empty part, all is lost, woe is us. Some of us see only the full part, happy, happy, happy. And the truth is in the middle. In the middle is where our hope resides. The baby Jesus has come. And, and we celebrate Christmas and we welcome the baby Jesus anew into our heart, Right? the Christ child, the incarnation, Emmanuel God with us. But the other thing that we think about and and look forward to in Advent is the not yet, right? That Jesus is coming again. So we have two tracks going on when we talk about Advent. So in the midst of all that, here's the truth. In the midst of this crazy, chaotic world, our hope is this. Number one, that Jesus is coming back. Number two, that God is in charge of the itinerary. God is in charge of the schedule. And three, get ready. And that's the message that Jesus shares with us this morning. We have in our gospel lesson for today kind of a snippet, the last portion of this conversation Jesus has with the disciples. It starts at the beginning of Luke's 21st chapter. And Jesus and the disciples are walking out of Jerusalem, right? And, and the disciples are just, it's just small talk. They say to Jesus, or just say really amongst themselves, wow, look at that temple, isn't it beautiful? Now, the temple was gilded with gold, and so when the sun hit it, it, w- it would just like shine and glow. And the, and the disciples are going on, this is a beautiful temple, that's God's house. Isn't it awesome? Isn't it great? And they're just kind of going back and forth. Beautiful day, beautiful temple, wow! And Jesus says, you know, it's funny you should mention that, but there, are, there is a day coming soon when not one stone will be left upon another, when this beautiful temple is going to be nothing but a pile, a heap of stones and mud, and it'll be worthless. 
And the disciples say, Whoa, glad we brought this up. When, what are the signs that this will happen? When will this take place? And then Jesus begins this dialogue with them, more like a monologue, telling them the signs, famines, wars, rumors of wars. If you look in your Bible, Luke 21, the chapter heading is signs of the end times. It's chaos. It's chaos. And yet right in the middle of that chaos, Jesus says, when you see these things happening, look up because your redemption is drawing near. In the midst of the chaos, there is hope. How many of you have ever seen It's a Wonderful Life, the movie? Yeah, I think all these movies are going to be shown at. It might have already been shown already. It's a great movie. You, you know pretty much the plot line, I'm sure. George Bailey is the head character, and it's a, parable. it's a parable about faithfulness. It's a parable about family and responsibility, but mostly it's a parable about hope and God's intervention in our lives. And you know how it goes. George is one of those great guys that everybody loves. He's selfless. He's easygoing. He gives of himself over and over again. But a crisis comes up in his life, right? The bank examiner is coming, and he suddenly finds out that there's a shortfall because George's uncle Billy has really messed up the accounting. And old man Potter's greed and jealousy is part of it, but George is the one who's going to take the fall for all this. On top of that, his daughter Zuzu is homesick from school. The despair builds, and George takes it out on the teacher, his daughter's teacher, when she calls to check up on the little girl, see how she's doing. And George leaves the teacher in tears with the teacher's husband swearing to knock his block off. Right? So George craters. He goes out for a drink, and sitting there, he offers up this prayer of despair. He admits he's not a praying man, but he asks God to intervene and show him what to do. God, what should I do here? In his despair, two of his friends tried to talk him into going home, and they call him by name. And it turns out that the guy sitting on his other side is the teacher's husband. Go figure. And it usually works that way, right? Who hits George in the mouth for berating his wife. George picks himself up the floor, touches his bloody lip, and says, that's what I get for praying. That's what I get for praying. He checks to see if his life insurance policy is still in his pocket, and he heads out to do the unthinkable because of his situation. In his despair, he decides the only way out is to take his life. Well, you know the rest of the story. George's guardian angel intervenes, and through showing George what life in the town would have been like without him, gives him a renewed sense of hope, and with that hope comes a new lease on life. And by the way, after the 8 o'clock service, I was, I was pulled aside by Sheila Schroer, who is our church treasurer, and she says, why do bank examiners always get the bad end of these things? I want you to put in the sermon that at the end, the bank examiner helps pay for the debt. So the bank examiner was a good person in all this. And she wanted me to say that. I promised her I would, so you can tell her I said that. She said, that's the main point of the whole story. I said, okay, okay. I'll... <sighs> Glad I remembered to say that, though. She'll, she will check. Now, so why is the movie so beloved? Why is the movie so beloved? Why? Because who can't relate to George Bailey? I mean, who really can't relate to George Bailey? I mean, who hasn't been there? Oh, we might not have been on the edge of a bridge ready to jump, or maybe we have. But we've all stood at the precipice of despair. We've all kind of questioned the uncertainty of life. We've all at least been at the end of our rope. So how do we find hope? Or better yet, how can we allow hope to find us in the midst of this world? It's movie illustration day here at Christ Church. Here's another movie for you. Jim Carrey and Bruce Almighty. Anybody seen Bruce Almighty? Yeah, yeah, a couple chuckles. You know, it seems like whenever we are in trouble and whenever we're seeking God out, we will say, Lord, show us a sign. It's exactly what the disciples did with Jesus at the beginning of Luke 21. Show us a sign, Lord, that all these things are going to take place. And that's really what triggered this whole list of signs that Jesus shares with them, signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. But in this movie, Bruce Almighty, starring Jim Carrey, there's a scene where Bruce's life has fallen apart. He's gotten fired. He got beat up when he tried to help a homeless man holding a sign. He's had a fight with his girlfriend, whose name just happens to be Grace. 
And he's driving along feeling sorry for himself, talking to and yelling at God, right? You ever done that? Yelled at God? Sure you have. Sure. I know you have, Larry. <laughs> I'm just in one of those moods today, sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so he's yelling at God. He's saying, okay, God, okay, God, you want me to talk to you? Then talk back. Tell me what's going on. What should I do? Give me a signal. Any of you have talked to God like that? Come on. Yeah, you have. Come on. I, I, I want to do what you want me to do, but you got to tell me what it is you want me to do. Right? Three by five card, sign, something, whatever. Well, you know what happens in the movie if you've seen it. He says, give me a signal. Just then he passes a tra lighted traffic message sign, which is blinking the words, caution ahead. Right? Well, he ignores it, and he continues his rant. I need your guidance, Lord, please. Send me a sign. And about that time, a truck full of traffic signs pulls out in front of him. Very visible are the signs, dead end, stop, wrong way, yield, no crossing, and do not enter. But Bruce ignores them. He ignores them. He doesn't see what he's asking for, complains about the truck, whips around the truck, only to eventually run into a light pole, and he gets out and he yells at God again. At the end of the scene, he answers, answer me, and then his pager goes off, right, with a telephone number. And he looks at him, sorry, I don't know you. I wouldn't answer it even if I knew who you were, right? But I think, I think Jim Carrey nailed it for us in that movie in terms of how sometimes we react. In the middle of difficult times, how often do we just slide by and miss God's signs for us? I mean, we pray for signs and then we just, we're so involved with the ookiness of our moment that we miss them. You know the old joke, right? The guy who's stuck in a flood and he prays for God to save him. And he's in the first floor of his house. He says, Lord, I need your help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drown if you don't come save me. And he, the waters come, and he moves to his second floor. The waters come, he moves to his roof. And along the way, a guy in a boat comes and says, come on, come on. Let me jump in the boat. I'll take you to a safe place. And the man says, no, I'm waiting for God to save me. Okay, second boat comes, the same conversation takes place. Finally, a helicopter comes and says, hovering over the house and says, here's the ladder, come on up. No, I'm waiting for God to save me. And he ends up drowning and he goes to heaven and he says to the Lord, I've got a bone to pick with you, Jesus. He says, I prayed and prayed and prayed that you saved me and you didn't, didn't lift a finger. And Jesus said, what do you want from me? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. But he was not able to see. There's a truth to that, right? There's a truth to that. And that's part of what Jesus was telling his disciples too. He says, you know, the signs are there. The signs have always been there. We just have to look. We have to get ready and stay ready so we'll know them when we see them. And that's what Advent's about. That's what Advent's about. We need to be prepared. If we're really going to see the Christ child, and I mean really see and perceive and receive into our heart again and anew the Christ child, right? If we're so distracted by the things going on around us some of it might be good some of it might not be so good but we're so distracted we'll miss the sign we'll miss the signs every single time you know i, I think about the question well then how how do we do that how do we get ready in our christian faith we say get ready and prep you know lots of people are prepping for the end times have you noticed that if you watch the Discovery Channel at all or the Science Channel, you, every once in a while you'll have the show on preppers, people who are stocking, you know, their shells, they're digging holes, you know, cellars, like kind of like happened in the early 60s, Bay of Pigs and all that, you know, everybody was prepping. Well, that's okay, but there's a special spiritual preparedness that we need to be about. So you could, you could call this list of things to do, maybe, the rights of Christian preppers, and it's really pretty simple. Love God, love our neighbors. Remember that was Jesus's, I mean, he said, you want to know what the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Pray every day. Do you pray every day? Do you pray every day? And when you pray, do you listen? You know, I, 
I, I get caught, you know, get caught up in you. End of the day prayer, you know, you're tired, had a long day. Okay, Lord, here's my list. I know you might want to talk to me, but it, I, I, need, I need to get some sleep, right? The, uh, listening is, is, praying is more about listening than it is speaking. How do we listen? So we love God, we love our neighbor, we pray every day, worship at least every week, live a life of generosity, live a life of gratitude, of thankfulness, not just at Thanksgiving. Read the instruction manual, the Bible, and help one another. It doesn't get much simpler than that. And when we do all those things, when we practice our faith and put it into action every single day, then we'll be able to not only see the signs, but we'll be able to read the signs as well, and we'll stay ready. We will stay ready. You know, I think of Advent hope. It's kind of like someone baking Christmas cookies. How many of you are bakers? You like to bake? So, so you know, if you want to put food coloring in something and make it a certain color, does it take a whole lot of food coloring? Just a drop or two, right? You're kneading the dough, you put a drop of food coloring, in, and the whole dough, the dough becomes that color. It doesn't take much. That's kind of like hope. We sprinkle this hope in Christ Jesus in everything that we do and everything we go and everything we say, and it spreads everywhere. It doesn't take much. William Barclay, in commenting on Paul's letter to the Romans, said this. He said, the Christian hope is the hope which has seen everything and endured everything and is still not despaired. That's important. The Christian hope is the hope which has seen everything and endured everything and is still not despaired because it believes in God. The Christian hope is not hope in the human spirit or in human goodness or in human endurance or in human achievement. The Christian hope is hope in the power of God. And that's not wishful thinking. It is the promise of God in Christ Jesus. So friends, Advent is the season when, like those two senior citizens, we're all, we are all asked to just go in and give ourselves up. Go in and give ourselves up to Christ and the hope he brings, now and always. Amen.